uh, here's my conflict of interest slide. Uh, so I have no conflict of interest with Somalogic. Nobody is paying me from their end for this seminar. Um, all right. So why why are we why, why are we studying uh, uh, proteins and 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 anything like that? The ba basic question I want to answer is what makes us different. And for that, are different reasons. And I think most of you know that already. There's, of course, the genetic underpinning of what, uh, what defines our, our organism. And then there are the factors, the, the lifestyle factors, what we eat, what we drink, whether we smoke, uh, whether we exercise, the drugs we take. And then also, most recently, it has been becoming a very important domain of study is the microbiome. All right. So all these factors play together, and they define, in the end, our risk to develop different complex disorders, cardiovascular disease, whether they get cancers, Alzheimer's risk, diabetes, and so on. So the, the, the real question, what makes us different with respect to this, this, uh, these disease risks and also with, a, with respect to how we can treat them uh, is uh, inscribed in our, our genes and how we interact with, uh, with the environment. And for that, we have a lot of technologies nowadays to, to study how these, uh, what, what's going on in our body, starting from genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, following the paradigm of biology, metabolomics, also intermediate traits like epigenomics, microRNAs, protein modification. And all these omics technologies are really very useful to study uh, complex disorders. In my talk today, I will focus on proteomics, especially on affinity proteomics uh, using the Somalogic platform. And uh, before I get into the technicalities of my talk, let me very briefly introduce to you what, uh, what the Somalogic platform actually does. So uh, somamirs are uh, DNA, my, uh, small DNA um, aptamirs that are trained to bind specifically to, to a specific uh, protein epitopes uh, called somamirs. So it's an affinity-based proteomics assay. And just to show you briefly how that works, that's also important to understand so, so that, that we as, as bioinformaticians know how to interpret the data. Um, so here, here's the principle. So, uh, it starts with um, the somamirs that are labeled with a fluorophore here in red, a photoclavical linker, and a biotin that is immobilized on streptavidin beads. Um, so these aptamirs will then be incubated with, uh, with a protein solution that can, can come from, from, from the blood, but basically there's also other applications like um, you know, uh, CV fluid, and, and even you can work on urine and things like that. Um, so these uh, somamirs uh, bind uh, their, 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 their target proteins, they form a complex with them. Some of them could be cognate, but there are also some cases where they just bind uh, a little bit. So in order to get uh, on with that, uh, the beads are then washed and removed uh, to remove the unbound proteins. The bound proteins are tagged with biotin, and then the, the somamir protein uh, complexes are photoclinic. So that, that's shown here. So you get complexes between the aptamirs, the proteins, the biotin label, and they are then in solution. Um, Non-specific interactions will then be uh, competitively disrupted using uh, polyanionic buffer. So all these kind of uh, weak bindings get, uh, get out. And then they are recaptured on another set of streptavidin beads uh, where they uh, bind with a biotin and collect them here. An additional washing step is done to remove non-specifically bound somamirs. And then the somamirs are released from the beads in a denaturating buffer. And uh, they will be hybridized uh, then uh, on a microarray chip uh, and quantifies by fluorescence. So in the, in the end, what, what somalogic really measures is, is binding affinity. It's, it's, it's not counting proteins, it's binding affinity. And binding affinity is translated into, into DNA and measured with classical microarray. Um, so in order to make these techniques precise, they, they are run in an array basis, so in, in, in batches of uh, nine, nine, around 90, 92 uh, uh, samples per, per plate. So in order to get rid of um, batch effects, there, there are calibrators on the plate. So you see here to the right the, the, the calibrators, and they will be normalized together so that they all get, uh, get, get on one name. And on the, on the left side, you then see how the distributions they can go back forth and again, of the, of the biological samples, then the normal distribution they actually get to overlap. And with this technology, uh, Somalogic gets excellent CVs. So the CV is, of course, a function of which, uh, the, which somamir you look at. If you look at the median, it's typically uh, around 5%. Five, 5 and that's also something we can. So this is from a white paper from Somalogic where we have seen some like 
uh, numbers on our end. A second important feature is the dilution range, because in plasma you have an extreme dynamic range to cover. Uh, so the way Sumologic do these, this is by actually working on three different dilution ranges so that you get uh, a really a 10 to the 8 uh, dynamic range to cover. And then finally, so what I show you here is the, 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 ta the, the targets of the SOMAMIRS, just that you know, so this is from the 1.3 array we are using. Uh, other arrays have, of course, bigger numbers here. And so, so in a way, you have to see this as, as a targeted protein. So you really uh, define what proteins you're looking at. And then you see here the different classes. We have a lot of proteases, receptors, cytokines, kinases, some intracellular, extracellular, and CPC. All right, so I hope this gives you a short introduction to how uh, the platform works. So now, how do we apply this? I think the very important thing, on, especially on the, the work of uh, I'm working on, is in population cohorts. And I think there's one very important key concept here, and that's the idea of experiments conducted by nature. So if you want to study humans or, or any biological processes in humans, we, we, we are not lab mice. So the thing is, we have a lot of uh, variants, what is shown here again, like in, in the lifestyle factors in our genes and everything, it's not like a monogenic uh, mouse model. So, so you need to go to really big cohorts and then actually each individual person is one realization, one experiment conducted by nature. And what we then do is we analyze them using the different omics technologies and uh, statistics. So population-based studies and also, of course, clinical studies, what they do is they identify risk factors by associating uh, the different factors, genomics, microbiome, and of course, all the lifestyle factors to the disease endpoints. There's lots of studies that epidemiologists uh, and clinical researchers do here, but they rarely really get to the causal pathways because there's a, a long way from, from, from the cause to the, to the complex disorder. So the, again, a very general concept, not only for project omics, it, it works also very well for other, other omics technologies, is that of the intermediate phenotype or deep molecular phenotype. So if you can do deep molecular phenotyping of large cohorts with, with one or more omics technologies, you really have this intermediate phenotype to draw on very strong associations or the stronger association between the causal factors and the intermediate trait, then also between the intermediate trait and the complex disorder. And then, of course, you can also link all the different omics against each other to really understand what's going on in these uh, populations. And that's what I want to talk about today. So deep molecular phenotypes, they actually can reveal affected pathways and indicate therapy options. And I hope I can show you today a few examples of how that works, especially with the, with the summer. All right, let's get into it right away. So as the title already indicated, I will have two parts. One is on genome-wide association studies, and one is a more recent study on epigenome-wide association studies. So let's start with the genome-wide. So what we focus on here is how genetics combines with proteomics. So a GWAS with proteomics, what is it? So this is a study I conducted together with Johannes Graumann, who was the, the person who also initiated the somologic platform here at Qatar. Um, and in that study, we actually used around 1,000 samples from the, the population study CORA in Germany, measured that on the 1.3 array from Sumologic with 1,100 proteins, and then associated them with 500,000 different genetic variants determined on the Affymetrix uh, axiom array in these 1,000 uh, persons from CORA. Then we used linear additive uh, genetic uh, regression models. This is a very, very simple statistic test adjusted for H10 and BMI. And then we inverse normally scale the proteins to make sure that the distributions are, are normal and we don't get too many uh, outlayers and, and artificial uh, signals. And I think then the, the, the first thing you look at is the Manhattan plot. So what, what is the Manhattan plot? Uh, what you see here is, the, is actually by chromosome position, the different genetic variants tested against an association with all the proteins. On the y-axis, you have the negative log of the p-value. Note it's cut off here. P-values get much more significant than 10 to the minus 20. And generally, the, the genome-wide cutoff is somewhere 10 to the minus 8. So in this study, just for the people who are not very familiar with GWAS, uh, genome-wide association studies, so each of these loci here, you can zoom in. And here would be a zoom on chromosome 8 and a very small piece of it. Here are the genes. So each of these dots would appear here. So this is what you would call a genetic locus. And here is an association of different uh, strands depending on which variant you look at. And then if you go for, for the top variant, this is what people also call a PQTL, a proteomics quantitative trait locus. 
it's an association where the genotype of the individual, so in this case, there would be the wild type, they would have a G at that point, there are 632 people here, there are heterozygotes and the homozygotes, and you see a very strong association with, in this case, uh, ARTS1 and the genotype. And this is one of these dots here. So what we find is if you go for multiple testing corrected p values, uh, 539 actually of these PQTLs with 284 proteins and 451 independent tests. And I will just show you a little bit what can be done with this. In the meantime, there have been more studies. And at the end, I will show you some of the references. So these studies are really growing more and more. And there's no, no big studies with, uh, with somologic. But let, let me explain to you the, the concept at this example. So one, one thing for GWAS is important is replication. So we did another study, and that was actually really run on our somologic platform in Qatar on, on, a, on a Qatar study, on the QMDIP study. And I think I don't want to give you all the details here. What's important is you, you just want to re replicate uh, all the hits that are there. So here are the percentages. Just let me go to the last one here. So if I look at the ones that really have enough replication power, so 95 replication power, we almost all uh, replicate them at, at, at a significant level. So that means that almost everything we've seen in the CORA study that can be replicated statistically is also replicated in the QM dive study. All right, and then at that time, I think it was one of the first larger things with uh, Somalogic, the larger GWAS. We also wanted to make sure that it's coherent with other studies, so replication on other platforms. So there have been some studies before, smaller studies with less samples or less proteins, with using immunoassays, earlier versions of somologic, and also mass spec based. And again, I don't want to get into all the numbers. If you're interested, this is all in, in our paper. Uh, here you see how many of uh, how many loci that could theoretically be replicated have been replicated. You see again very good replication on the earlier version, but also good replication on the MS space. Well, of course, I should note there's a different overlap between MS and, and some other. But all, uh, all over is very, very good replication. And then the other interesting thing is once you go and you study thousands of proteins just in one go, you are, I mean, it, it's such a quantum leap. What, what you see here is uh, 16 different GWAS that all have been conducted one by one with immunoassays and published in GWAS, many of them even in, in nat nature genetics. And what you see is that all of these are actually different papers here with different uh, like IL-6 receptor granulins, uh, selectin, uh, all kind of very interesting clinical relevant GWASs have been replicated just in one go using the small All right, now for, <clears throat> for the more technical um, interpretation. So I use already the term PQTL. So a protein QTL is an association, as I said before, between a genetic variant or locus where there are correlated genetic variants and protein levels. That could be sometimes one, that could be more. One concept that's important is that of a cis and a trans association. So a cis association would mean that the genetic variant is somewhere in the gene that codes for the protein that we are measuring. So that's a cis association. And then you can imagine the question is like, which of these variants are actually the causal ones. And you can imagine there could be variants that are regulatory variants, near a promoter, there could be splice variants, truncating variants, coding variants, there could be variants in regulatory microRNAs, and all of these variants could, of course, have an effect on the transcript itself, on mRNA turnover, on translation, or even on the protein. And then there are the trans PQTLs, where actually the genetic variant would be sitting in another gene that is not measured. Uh, on the platform, but in, 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 a, in a translocated gene that could be another cr chromosome. Um, so that variant would again have an, any kind of effect on, on that protein. And then in order to see a trans PQTL, there has to be uh, by definition an interaction with the, the protein we look at. And then again, you can ask what, what's going on? Is it a regulation that could be a variant in a transcription factor that regulates uh, the protein I'm measuring? It could be in a microRNA that would degrade the, the RNA, would uh, influence the mRNA turnover, there could be protein-protein interactions, and even post-translation modification. So what you see is once you do a GWAS on, on a large set of proteomics with this kind of, of, of detail, you really get very, very rich uh, information. And I will show you a few examples of that in a minute. Um, but before I do so, I think I should also call the elephant in the room. I mean, there are, of course, uh, caveats to these technologies. Some people think they are important. Uh, I will just tell you what, what I personally think about them. Uh, one caveat is what we call epitopic. 
And an epitope effect is actually uh, a genetic variant that would change the epitope of the protein and in the end only change the binding affinity of the uptime. So then you would get different protein levels associated with a genetic variant, but in the end they would be just only due to the fact that there is an epitope difference. They are still biological effects, but they would in the end be probably not clinically relevant. Um, so if you look at these epitope effects, uh, you of course have different techniques to find that out, and we'll show you a bit how to cope with them. One thing is, so what we looked at in our QMDIAP study is we used another assay, an immunoassay, and here is like for 120 different uh, PQTLs, the correlation of the effect sizes of the, of the associations. And what you see, there's generally very good agreement between the two platforms, except for a few really extreme outliers. Like here, for instance, there's a very strong negative association with uh, ICOM-1 on the somalogic platform and a positive association on the immunoassay platform. And the thing is, if you correlate the ICOM-1 measures between both platforms, uh, so in the end, there would be initially absolutely no correlation at all. But if you then would color them by genotype, then suddenly you, you identify that there is actually some correlation between the two platforms, but it's stratified by genotype. And that's, that's what I mean. So the, the uptime year for the G version would be much stronger binding than the uptime year for the A version. And the person who has heterozygote would have like half of them would bind stronger than, than the others. And that's what you find here. And probably the immunoassay platform would also have, see this effect, but on an if, inverse way. So that's what you see here. There's a negative association between the genotypes uh, for the same variant on the, on the uptime year platform and on the immunoassay platform. Okay, so you have to be aware there are some of these. Uh, so the effect, epitope effect, is a genetically influenced uh, binding. So indicators for that are strong cis-PQTLs, generally no overlapping eQTL, because if you would have an expression QTL, of course, it would tell you that, that uh, RNA is involved, so that would indicate that it's probably a, a real one. Protein changing variant in LD, so if you find a, a good candidate for an epitope, so that, that's the indicators. And the remedy, of course, I mean, you could confirm it with an independent assay or even MASPEC. Um, in some cases, I mean, in this one, for instance, you could actually correct for the cis uh, SNP because the, the assay is still working. It's just very strongly influenced by the cis variant. Um, in, uh, investigate co-localization with eQTLs would be a way to, to exclude uh, epitope effects. And then also you could, could have, uh, if you have whole genome sequencing, check whether there's any, actually a candidate for, for, for uh, epitope changing variant. The second thing, where people are always a bit wary of is, of course, off-target binding. So you have to be sure that your, your binder is really binding what, uh, what it says. So Somamir is following up on these things as well. So just as an example here, there have been cases, or I mean, one case here, where actually the, the Somamir was trained on uh, alkaline phosphatase, but actually there was, was an error in the protein preparation, and it was actually luck to transfer it. So the thing is actually binding, not what was on the label. Uh, so here again, the indicator would be strong trans QTLs, absence of any cis QTL, and a remedy would be, of course, to confirm target uh, specificity using pulldowns. And I think a very good source for that is a recent paper with somologic technology in Nature Medicine, uh, where the, the supplement uh, gives you for, for many of the, the upcoming years already evidence for, for tests they have. All right, with this out of the way, let me show you a few examples of, uh, of interesting cases. I think one we came up, and this is actually not an epitope effect, although it's a very strong one, and I will show you how. So here the TT variant of this variant would actually lead to a near total loss of the CPN1 uh, protein. And that's what the somologic data suggests. In this case, we can validate uh, by using RNA-seq data, actually from a totally different kind of cells, lymphoblastoid cell lines from a totally different study. And you find a similar a signal here between the, the expression levels. So this would be a co-localized um, expression QTL, supporting that this is a real, a real case. And in this case, you can even go further. So you could look at, at the, the transcripts, and what you see here is a genetic variant, not the one it's associated with, but a genetic variant in the transcript. And what this shows, this is a hetero, it's just from one heterocycle, it actually shows you that there's only one transcript, almost, with a G variant that is transcribed, and not the C variant. So you would have actually allele-specific expression. There's only, so in this case, there would only be one allele expressed 
and the, the T allele would actually not be expressed. So some people who have only the T allele would only have very, very, very few expression. So in this case, we could show this is a real case where there's absolutely full loss of a protein in certain people, and these are absolutely healthy people. So a very interesting case to study what, what, that, what the function of that protein actually is. So in this case, one copy would be silenced by genetic variant. Uh, so examples of biomedical interest. Um, there's another thing is overlap with, of course, um, GWAS data with, 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 with complex disorders where you would have a genetic association that associates also in this case with ankylosing spondylitis. And here I actually have also shown a case where there's two different variants. So these two SNPs here. And if you have four copies of, so two copies from one and two copies of the other of the risk variant, then you had the highest expression of, of ERAP1. We can again replicate that in the, in, in, the, in the lymphoblastoid cell lines with the expression to service level. So it really shows that this one here, again, it's not an epitope effect, it's really an expression level that translates into protein. And then you can look at these two variants, and they are actually also additive with respect to the risk of ankylosing spondylitis. So in this case, you know there's probably a causal reason here between uh, the neonatal genetic variant and the ankylosing spondylitis and might be mediated by ERAP1. To do a full analysis, you would do something that's called Mendelian randomization. I cannot go into that here, but I think it's a starting point to really do something with, with this proteomics data. Um, another example uh, here is uh, SLAM F7. So that here you see again a QTL that is replicated in, in, in the lymphoblastoid cell lines. And this is a target uh, of, um, of a monoclonal antibody for, for cancer uh, treatment, elotrozumab. So in this case, you could think, is there maybe a genotype dependent response to, to that drug? So would people maybe respond better if they have more of, of this, this target protein? And then the interesting thing is, uh, sorry, I have it here again, uh, here. So if you then look at, uh, so here again is the, is the, the PQTL, but then there's a second variant, in, which is a very rare variant that only exists in, in these combinations. And this double variant here, if they are minorly homozygous for both variants, they actually have almost no SLAM F7 signal at all. And the same thing replicates in the QM diab study. So the question here would be, with these people, if they don't have that protein, there's no absolutely no reason to give them the, the ilotrozumab group. So we would actually be able to identify potential long responders. All right, then drug target validation. Um, I think there's a huge interest of pharmaceutical industry in PQTLs. Uh, and I think that has been a, very well summarized by a paper by Robert Plenji and, and, and others, where they show in a review all the, all the conditions you need to actually use natural occurring genetic variation to derive dose response curves. The, the, the basic idea is in the end that you just look for genetic association with wild type and, and heterozygotes and homozygotes and then try to figure out whether, whether you can understand the pharmacological functioning of, of that variant. So there, there's really an effect there. And here are examples. So there's IL-18, uh, and I think here, for instance, IL-6 uh, soluble receptor, you, you really find a very nice dose response curve that you could model by, by these genetic variants. All right, so that's for, for, the, for the usage of the individual QTLs. Now, now let's go for the annotation of the associations. I think there's another concept that's very important and people who are not from the genetics fields should be made aware of that. That's the LD, what you call linked disequilibrium or LD. And that is something where you actually have variants that are highly correlated and different uh, study results could be reported not on the same variant, but on other variants. So there is a technique called block annotation where you could pull these all together. So I could query the SNP for regulatory variants, for, for methylation QTLs, for all kinds of things. And this is what we did. So if you look at these different variants we identified, you could say for the study we have here, there. There are QTLs for methylation, there are QTLs that are in, in regulatory elements, expression QTLs, transcript modifying variants, then of course our cis and trans QTLs from our study. You can overlay with them with glycosylation QTLs, metabolomics QTLs, and then finally uh, with complex disorders and, and risk factors. So the thing is, once you do a PQTL study, you can overlap it using this technique uh, with all kinds of other information with the variants that are in LD. And then the idea is how can we present this in a way that people can really use the data, work with this. So in this case, I said there's here 
42 different disease endpoints that overlap with at least one of the PQTLs. So they are here. So you see there's really a broad range of different diseases that overlap with, uh, with the PQTLs. And then you can present them in a big network. So where you would have like, it initially looks like a hairy ball, but you would have in that network, you would have like the proteins, the GWAS associations, the SNPs. That would be a very messy thing in the beginning, but you can go and just say, oh, I just want to pull at something that interests me and then look at the, at the sub-network. And here's just an example to show you, there's a very complex association at the ABO, the, 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 the blood uh, type locus, where there's actually three different variants. They associate with a bunch of proteins that correlate among each other. And there are also a lot of different uh, risks from, from GWAS, uh, ranging from coronary heart disease to thromboembolism. And I think there's also a blood group that is a risk factor for, for, for cancer. So all this here is data that's just derived from GWAS, normal GWAS, PQTL GWAS, and then you can undertake them in addition. So on the top here, I now added everything that you can do once you have tools like IPA, Ingenuity Pathway Analysis, for instance. You can say, uh, put all the proteins in there and say, how are they connected? And what we found here is like, so I have this kind of annotations from IPA, like Notch1 regulates Tai1, KDR associates with CDH5, and so on. So all these are actually papers, most of them mouse studies or cell studies that connect these genes among each other. And if you pull the whole picture together, in the end, it comes out, plays a role in ang angiogenesis. So you could create hypotheses like this to say all this GWAS here actually suggests that these variants here play a role in ang angiogenesis, which in the end, if you look at the different associated diseases, makes, makes a lot of sense. Uh, if you want to use this data more, so we have a proteomics.gwas.eu web server where you can address every data in, in a very convenient form, including the networks. And then I think I mentioned already, there's a lot of other people working on GWAS. So I have a blog, uh, metabolomics.com with an X here, where I maintain a table of all published uh, GWAS with um, proteomics. And on that one, I, I haven't counted the last time how many they are, but I tried to, from the first study, to have them all in there from all platforms. Uh, there are the other two studies with somologic technology, so one in nature uh, with, uh, with the in-house platform with about 3,000 proteins, and then the most recent one with, the, with about 4,000 proteins in, in science. So you can really get to, to the bottom of all these PQs if you're interested. And I think there's a lot of, lot of uh, other examples uh, very well described in this all right, no, that was uh, what I wanted to say about GWAS with proteomics. I hope I've already showed you a little bit the, the, the passion I have for, for this kind of data and what you can really, really do with it. Now I would like to go to something new, which we just uh, published uh, earlier this year, and that would be an epigenome-wide association study with proteomics, where you combine now the epigenome with the protein. And, and this is something I haven't presented so much, so bear with me if it, if it goes a bit more roughly. Um, in Ewart Proteomics, it's work done by Shaza Saglul in my, in my group. So that has been published in, uh, it's not written here, in January 20, 2020. Um, so the idea is, I mean, with GWAS, it's relatively easy. You can say the SNP is always causal because the SNP is always defined at, at birth or at conception, actually. Uh, with EWAS, it's different. So EWAS, in EWAS, you study epigenetics. So that is DNA methylation. So it would also have like arrays that genome might give you about 450,000 different uh, readouts for CPG sites, whether they are methylated or not. And common wisdom, I mean, there's a lot of more complicated things, but common, common wisdom says that are specific sites that methylate proto, um, promoters, and if they are methylated, they shut down the expression of, uh, of the genes. It's pretty rough, but that's basically the, 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 the standard concept. So if you look at methylation data, you get numbers between zero and one, which means it's the percentage of uh, a specific CPG site that is methylated. And then the first question is, why do I get a value between zero and one? Shouldn't it be unmethylated? Both copies of the chromosome should be methylated or half. So initially, I, I thought there should be zero, oh, five, and one, and not a total spectrum. But what you actually find is, uh, is an association with, with a, with a with some kind of a range like 0 point, between 0 0.2 and 0 0.3 with different uh, protein levels or, or, or any, any real number, but not the whole spectrum. And the reason for that is that you don't measure the methylation of a single cell. You always measure it of, of an ensemble of cell, either in the blood or in an organ. 
So what I represent here are the cells of an organ where initially all the methylation uh, sites shut down uh, a, specific, uh, a specific gene. And then this gene would have a role to cope with some kind of a molecule that could be glucose that, or, or some, some uh, toxin or, or, or whatever comes, uh, comes around that the organ has to work with. And then if there are some molecules, the, the, the methylation gets shut, uh, gets activated at some loci, and then the organ can deal with it, and then it's good the others don't have to do that. But if there's more molecules coming, more need to be switched on for the organ to do it. So if you had put that in a more broader picture, I think the really the basic concept as I see it is like if you have like a 30% methylation value in a healthy organism for a certain side, it would indicate that 30% of the cells are actually really doing the job. If it's 70%, then if the methylation level would be 0.7 or 70%, then 70% of the cells would be doing the job. And that means that in a certain way, the methylation would give you a readout of what the organ really does. Because I think methylation is, 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 is a consequence, is, is an adjustment. It's maybe a very precise way to measure gene expression. So, so with this concept in mind, we ran an EWAS on the somologic platform. So we had, uh, again, the, the, the CORA study, the same as before, with validation and replication in the QM diet study, uh, 1,100 proteins, and the 450K um, array from Illumina. And what we initially find is an enormous amount of, we call them PQTM, so um, quantitative trace loci, loci for methylation for, with, with proteins. So we found 38,000 and about 12,000 replicated in QM diab. And I mean, only a few of them, the, the numbers are smaller because of statistical power, not because they don't really replicate. If you look at the power, it, as I showed for the, the SNPs already, basically everything replicates in the, in the smaller study where there's enough statistical power. So we have, 38,000 um, PQTMs, uh, which is quite, quite a big number. Now, the thing is, as I said, uh, methylation is not causal. Methylation is, is a readout. It, it acts, uh, it's, it, it's reactive to, to, to external factors. And so what we did is we regressed out one by one the major confounding factors. And if I go and regress out initially uh, the, the, the sex of the, of the participants, I actually kick out 13,000 associations that are actually confounded by sex. So the, the, the sex would drive the CPG and the protein, so the association between both would be confounded. Um, after that, the next big driver is white blood cells, which again is not very surprising because we're measuring in white blood cells and also we measure proteins in blood where many come from the white blood cells. So there's a huge amount that are actually confounded by white blood cells. So if someone has more of like lymphocytes, then the CPG specific to the lymphocytes and the, and the protein specific to the lymphocyte would both correlate with the lymphocyte level, and then they are confounded by the white blood cell count. So, though, so that's not something where there's a direct correlation between the CPG and, and the protein. And then we can go on with the SNPs. I mean, I don't want to get into all the details, but there are also a lot of reasons why SNPs can, can confound uh, CPG protein associations. Age plays a role, um, smoking, BMI, diabetes. In the end, we also tried other PCAs from both sides, but there was no more really big confounding factors. So in the end, we ended up with 318 PQTMs that are not confounded by anything. So there is very likely a direct link between the proteins and the CPGs, and 98 of them replicated. So here again, the same thing, a Manhattan plot now for the methylation. And I, I just want to go here. So I want to go again through this process here and show you how that looks in terms of Manhattan. So here you see these like 30,000 hits, the initial ones. And then you see once I correct for SNP between here. So I hope you can see how I go back and forth. So there's a lot of very strong hits that are really confounded by, by sex. They disappear. And then once I correct for white blood cell counts, so I go back back and forth here again, you see there's really, especially at the baseline, a lot of confounding due to white blood cell count. When I kick out this, the SNPs, see the, the, here the, the scale change. So there are a few very, very strong sec, uh, SNP confounded variants that disappear. And then age, smoking, I, they have less effect. So I end up with Manhattan plot where I then I have my final uh, hits that I can interpret. All right, and then once I have this CPG, protein associations, I can now ask why 
are these CPGs associated with the proteins? Because for these, I know there is no driving factor behind it. They are not confounded by anything I could identify, not even anything hidden, hidden because we put in also the PCA. And then in order to understand what's going on, we can now uh, complement this with data like CPG and protein association with clinical phenotypes. So in the CORA study, we have that. Uh, we have in the QM diet study also metabolomics data. Gene expression data to CPGs is publicly available through the BIOS server. And then I mentioned already IPA. So just to get a grip on, 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 on the literature, if I use the IPA tool, I put in the, the, the proteins coming from the CPG genes and the proteins that are associated with them and use the a tool like Connect in, in IPA, it would, create me, would give me all the papers that actually link these two proteins, maybe sometimes through an intermediate. And this is the kind of annotation we can do now to understand them. And I will show you just one really interesting example of what, what comes out here. And then, of course, you can also query uh, literature on existing CPG and also protein associations to these. So the thing I want to show and discuss with you for a little bit is the NLRC5 network. So NLRC5 is a, is a protein that regulates the inflammasome. But there's not so much to be known about that. And what I show you here with the same color code as before is like here are there, there are three CPG sites and everything of this is replicated in QM diet that associate with these uh, seven different proteins on the somalogic cell. And they are all also replicated associations. So these are the PEWAS hits, NLRC5, and then also PCMB8 and HCP5. And then I can add additional information, the clinical phenotype. So what you see here is associations now in core. So what, what comes up, there's a lot of associations with metabolic syndrome, body mass index, type 2, uh, diabetes, uh, lipids, hypertension. And then I can add the metabolomics. And what, interestingly, we find two metabolites that in urine that are actually markers for, uh, for inflammation, especially neopterine is, is, is a very well-known uh, marker. And then we can go for expression level and can actually see that all these proteins have also an association between the CPG and the expression level in the BIOS database. So that supports the, the idea that the methylation is actually driving or controlling the, the, the gene expression. And then finally, I can use the, uh, the IPA to, put, to connect them, to say what, what has uh, NLRC5 to do with B2M, for instance, and the link is very clearly in this case MHC uh, class 1, because B2M is one of the proteins making up the MHC class 1 uh, proteins, and NLRC5 is regulating that one. And then HLA, I mean, the other ones, uh, you, you can imagine, they, they all play a role in uh, chronic inflammation. And then if I check which of the CPGs are actually associated in an EWAS with disease, I find a lot of uh, very coherent hits that would also really support the idea that there's low-grade inflammation going on. So the, in summary, what you see here is the NLRC5 methylation protein network really actually reveals processes that associate chronic low-grade inflammation. And I think I mentioned before, imagine these are measures in a thousand different people. Some people have low NLRC5 and then they may have, have also low B2M and then they may have like little, low values of HDL the other way around. So in the end, it reveals a whole pathway of chronic inflammation and gives you an idea on what pathway you could now try to interfere and to investigate to understand what actually drives uh, these different complex disorders. All right, so with this, I mean, there's a lot of other things in that paper, but I don't, I can go into all this here at this stage. So please have a look at our, our paper, the paper from Shaza Sakhlu, who has been published in 2020. Um, I just noted also, I mean, everything I talked to you about today was about EWAS and GWAS with proteomics. Uh, I never mentioned before, we actually see very, very similar concepts, absolutely different associations, but very similar concepts when you do GWAS with metabolomics and actually even EWAS with metabolomics. So if you're really interested in this topic, please have a look at these papers as well. If you mail me, I can even send you, I think, a link to a webinar on that. And with that, I come to my conclusion. So I think the, the in the end, you want to make a concept out of this. So the idea is there's genetic predisposition. That is one of the driving factors of complex disorders. But then, and these are actually like, especially for the metabolomics, but I think it's also true for the proteins. They are like settings of different vibes in your body. 
So there are settings of what your body can actually do. So that's set, that, that's something you cannot change. But then of course you can change your lifestyle uh, and, and, and also your exposure to, to environmental insult. And then if you have disease, it also can exasperate uh, the, and, and act as a further driving factors to, to drive things on. So these driving factors would then lead to changes in the intermediate phenotype, which again could be metabolomics, lipidomics. We talked a lot about proteomics today and glycomics which then would induce, so these changes would induce then again, changes in gene expression and DNA methylation. So I think DNA methylation is actually a very good proxy for gene expression, which is much harder to measure in population studies. And then this, this feedback again become driving factors. So in the end, you really have a hen and an egg problem here. But I think the message is like CPGs um, and, and PQTNs, they're actually like, uh, like these dials in, 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 in your system and your genes are, are, are your set, uh, set models. So with that, uh, I think I would like to close with what you can really do with this. PQTLs, they can really reveal causal pathways. So I haven't got very technical here. There are techniques like poly polygenic risk cause, Mendelian randomization that you can all do now on these kind of very complex uh, data sets. And the DNA methylation is very complementary to that as it's actually a readout of the organism's response to disease. So, all right, and with this, I would like to acknowledge my funder. Most of this has been funded by Qatar Foundation under the Biomedical Research Program to Well Cornell Medical College. Uh, there have been, of course, not only me working on this, a lot of colleagues from my team, former and present, uh, have contributed to this, and I really cannot name all the contributions we had from, uh, from all the, the cores in, in Cornell, in New York, and Qatar, and our colleagues here. And with that, I thank you and hand back to the organizers and wait for questions. Great, thanks, Karsten. We do have some uh, questions. Um, first of all, for data analysis, how do you determine a cutoff value of signal intensity um, below which will be considered as background noise? Yeah. Um, well, in the end, the models we use are statistical models. So the, you have to choose your p-value, typically 0.05. And then you have to correct for multiple testing. And the most rigorous multiple testing would be Bonferroni correction. So I have to divide your p-value, uh, your target p-value by the number of tests you do, which would be, in our case, 500,000 SNPs and 1,000 proteins, which comes up around 10 to the minus 11, and similar for the CP. And then, especially in genetic studies, there's an extra um, uh, requirement to actually replicate everything, again, at Bonferroni level, where you then correct for the number of, of replicated loci in an independent study. Great, thanks. Um, did you test the binding affinities of the ap aptamers that you presented here to different genotypes of the protein? Um, well, in the end, we do that because as I said, somalogic is in the end measuring affinity. So the, the affinity, it measures the affinity, which gets translated into protein, um, into protein, where you assume it's protein quantity, but it could also, also be binding. So the example I showed, the ICOM-1, the epitope effect, that's, that's probably a binding. But technically, we personally didn't, didn't measure that, no. Okay, great. This next question um, came up when you were talking about uh, annotations of CPG protein associations. Um, uh, they asked, did you mean uh, 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 white blood cell differentials? Um, and so I'm not, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know, it could, it could just been so, something you said that maybe it is in passing, but. No, I mean, I mean, there, 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 there's one, one thing, I think, I, I don't know what the question, maybe someone can specify. I think one thing is uh, we measure in white blood cells. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, white blood cells are not white blood cells. There are different types of, of B cells and T cells and, and, and all that kind of stuff. In methylation, there is a way of actually deriving that composition out of the methylation data called the Hausmann method. And that's something we used. Okay, uh, great. Um, I think this, this one goes back to uh, the, the previous question that, that this person asked. Uh, the question is about signal intensity, not statistical significance. Um, um, and I didn't know if you wanted to, to say anything about can, that. Yeah, no, signal intensity. Um, the thing is we are dealing here with like, from somalogic, we get 
in the end numbers, this FPO values. Um, I personally have a pretty pragmatic approach to that. Uh, I don't really care about uh, signal to noise. If it's in the noise, I wouldn't see a, a signal because I'm correcting Bonferroni on, on all the tests I do. I could do too many correction. I could be too hard. I could have too many um, false negatives by, by that approach. That, that's, that's true. But I personally have, have, am of the opinion I don't want to exclude anything by saying I look at detection limits or something like that. If it's below the detection limit, uh, there shouldn't be a signal. And if I'm Bonifroni correcting, I shouldn't get any.